Well, I have to begin today by offering a correction. Yesterday at the end of, my, of the devotional, I said that we would uh, be continuing to talk about the role of widows or the responsibilities of widows and their care. And I was wrong. Uh, it may have been a Freudian slip. I was trying to avoid the next topic because the next topic deals with uh, compensation for pastors or elders, spiritual leaders in the church. And, you know, it's not the most comfortable talk for me to talk about because, um, yeah, it's just not the most comfortable topic to talk about. But uh, what Paul says in verse 17 is the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those who work in preaching and teaching. Now, <clears throat> the word double honor here really literally means twice payment. It means uh, double pay. And uh, there are some people who take that in a literal sense and demand that they receive double compensation. I don't even know how you measure that. How do you measure double compensation? Because you have to begin by saying, this is what uh, people get and then I want twice that and that's where in fact a lot of people in the word faith movement rationalize uh, Their greediness is all I can call it their desire to ever have more and more money and <clears throat> become incredibly wealthy uh, By this particular passage and I really don't think that's what Paul means uh, when you realize that some of the richest people in our country are uh, word faith teachers, guys who teach the prosperity gospel, you know, that, uh, I mean, men like Ken Copeland, who is worth three quarters of a billion dollars. I mean, $750 million worth of wealth and assets. I mean, uh, I don't know. I, I, I just don't know how you can even even rationalize that. But, you know, that's again, it's uh, that's what he's been all about. And I think that, you know, one of the things they lose sight of is that just one chapter later, in fact, in verse 6 of chapter 6, uh, Paul actually offers a very cautionary note uh, to those of us who are in ministry about this whole issue of money. He said, but godliness with contentment is great gain. And now he said be previous to that that some people believe that gain is godliness. In other words, uh, like the Pharisees or even the word faith people teach that the more money you have is an indication of how much God loves you. Your godliness is directly proportionate to your, your bottom line. Uh, and Paul is coming out and saying that's absolutely the opposite of what's true, that the key is to be godly and to be contentment. That's the greatest gain you can ever have. Because one of the sad realities is that even though we all know it, none of us really believe it in our hearts, but we, we know that money doesn't make us happy, but yet the reality is more and more people actually do believe that money is the key to happiness. And if you think that doesn't apply to you, just remember when you go and look in your bank account and there's not enough money to cover the expenses, then you begin to find out how much you depend upon money to have peace of mind. And even though Jesus spoke extensively, especially in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, in chapter six, about not worrying about these things, nonetheless, we do worry, we do stress, we do concern ourselves. And at the same way, when you look at the opposite, when our bank accounts are flush or we have lots of money coming in, the paychecks are, are above and beyond what we need, then we begin to feel really good about ourselves and even can begin to develop a sense of arrogance as God has blessed and prospered us. That's why the whole issue of money is such a slippery and dangerous issue. That's why Paul goes on to explain in verse 7 of chapter 6, he says, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Food and clothing, we will be content with that. And then he says, people who want to get rich <clears throat> fall into temptation and a trap and to many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into destruction. And the reason he says is because the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. In other words, when we begin to become concerned about getting more and more money, that's going to open doors for us to take advantage of all sorts of transgressions. Uh, you know, in one sense, you could say that there's some sins that poor people can never access. But if you're a guy like Jeffrey Epstein and you've got unlimited wealth, well, then you can open up all sorts of doors that you shouldn't even think about in the first place. And we can certainly see it destroyed him and a whole lot of other people. But he goes on, Paul said, some people are eager for money. And that word eager 
really stuck my, got my attention as I was looking at it because it literally describes somebody who is stretching out as far as they can to grab hold of something that they want really, really bad. It's just that it's the idea of this grasping greediness of a person. He says they become eager for money. And he says the result, they've wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. I mean, I was just having this conversation with some folks who had been taken advantage by a very well-known and wealthy businessman in our community and found out he'd done it to several people. But the thing was really sad is that he died. He died with all of that wealth. And you know how much he took with him? Well, you know, and I do. And I often think about if you live like that and then you die and you have to stand before the before God, uh, I don't want to have to give account to God for something like that. That terrifies me. The fear of God is one of those things that tempers really our love of money. And so it keeps us from doing things we shouldn't do. And yet, sadly, in society and in the church, we find that money becomes oftentimes a real stumbling block, a real issue for people. And he says, in contrast to that, he says, but you, man of God, flee from all this, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Those are the things that you should be living for. Those are the things you should be concerned about. So if we go back to our passage in verse 17 that we looked at in chapter 5, he talks about those leaders, those pastors who lead the affairs or direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of, I would say, adequate fair compensation within the parameters of what the church can afford. Now, <clears throat> it's interesting because he, when we talk about how what does he mean by directing the affairs of the church? Well, I know that in my church, the affairs of the church are so many, I can't even keep track of them. So we have a lot of people who watch over things. But I think most importantly, it's the really the direction that you're steering the church towards. What is the prophetic message that you're giving to your congregation? Uh, are you preparing them for not only their growth in Christ, but for what is coming in the future? Are they going to be spiritually and adequately equipped? Because to me, I look at our facility. We have a large facility. We've got, I mean, it's 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 a big operation. And but what if suddenly the the government just simply turns against us and and takes all that away? Then what's going to happen? Have the people been equipped and prepared adequately to continue on? As we saw in the COVID uh, epidemic, how quickly things can change, how overnight the government was shutting down churches and silencing really the voice of pastors uh, and by, by just the function of not letting them uh, open, keep their doors open. Well, we realize that we can lose the handle really, really quickly and things can change very quickly. And so if your dependency is upon money or your dependency upon your physical assets and so forth, those kings can evaporate very quickly, but maybe even more importantly, you can't take any of them with you. And so when I think about directing the affairs of my church, what is my concern is not the financial situation that the church is facing or how stable or effective it is. What I'm really concerned is, are we really leading the church in a direction that helps people to grow in Christ and prepares them to fight the fight of faith? Because keep in mind, as Paul is writing all these things, he himself has gone through many imprisonments. He spent two years in prison in Rome. And then when he writes his last letter to Timothy, at least the last that we have, he is in Rome waiting to be executed. And his concern is not about the financial affairs of the church. His concern is about the spiritual affairs of the church. And that's what I think when he says he directs the affairs of the church well, that's what he's talking about. Now, I do understand that a church, like any organization, needs to be operated in a business-like manner in terms of handling its finances well and being accountable and using them effectively. I get all of that. And, and we have people who are skilled at that. That's what our board of elders really is responsible for, as well as my executive pastor and others. But the simple fact is we do that thing to keep in good standing and to, and to do things that are above reproach. But at the end of the day, we're not a money-making operation. We're not a business. We are a church. And too often in this day and age, those two get confused. And I find that oftentimes pastors and the leadership of churches really see what they're doing as being more of a business. It's more about the bodies, it's about the buildings and the bucks than it is about anything else. 
And at the end of the day, we're taking none of it with us. And so we need to hold very loosely to those things because as Corey Ten Boom said, we never know when God is going to require them of us. So anyway, my thoughts about that will continue tomorrow, picking up uh, the next part of the passage where he talks about not muzzling the ox. Blessings.